Hey guys, welcome to my Heathkit HG10 VFO restoration first look. That's what I'd like to call this. This video is going to probably run a little bit long because I had to, I have to go through the process in my head. <clears throat> um, I have to, yeah, this will be the first run through. And I hope it turns out, because uh, there's nothing worse than recording a 15-minute video, and you go to check it out, and it was recorded in millennial mode or something. <laughs> okay, so a first couple things before we begin. I'm going to turn my lighting on before we start, after I show you something. And uh, when while I'm showing you the VFO, um, you'll, you'll be seeing shadows and such as I walk around behind the camera because I just can't get better at that. <laughs> this is not my typical type of video. Um, usually I don't care about quality and in fact sometimes it's by design. It's my shtick. <laughs> okay, so the most important thing first. I'm going to pause you. Sorry for the aspect ratio. Uh, what would you call it? Perspective error. Uh, the phone's tilted up, but that's not the main point. The main point is, what the hell would you do? You're driving from L.A. to Vegas, right? Out in the middle of nowhere, and you come upon that. What would you do, man? <laughs> okay, hang on. Oh, man, isn't she gorgeous? Where's my cigar? Oh, man, we'll call this one Monica. Hang on, man. I want to zoom out. Let's see. There we go. Okay, got the UFO out of the way. Uh, I'm going to pause you. Turn the lights on. Hang on. Bench tools. Today is your first bench tool tip. You might know what those are, do you? They're Greenlee punches. They're crazy expensive. I only have three. There's two of them in that box. That one is a 5 8 He goes in that box. Check this box out, man. Look at that. <laughs> and what a Greenlee punch is. See the bolt that goes through there? You drill a small pilot hole, and then one goes on each side of the piece of metal, and you just crank that down. Punches a perfectly clean hole through your sheet metal. That's out of that box because I use that to punch the hole in the roof of my F-150 pickup for my antenna mount. So, okay, we'll move those. Hang on. Tilted. When looking at a unit like this, um, usually it's on eBay. Um, hopefully I can find them at estate sales where they don't know what they're dealing with. And that's what I did with all three of these Heath Kit units. I got them all really, really cheap. And so I give the case a, a once over. Are there any dents? Is there any rust, scratches, and such like that? I'm not talking about the front panel, just the rest of the case. And you'll see here, a little spot of real light rust there, and this rust here. Okay? To me, that's nothing. This can be quickly sanded off. Um, probably with steel wool to start with, and uh, yeah, they, they can be touched up and polished out to great degree, and it could be touched up with paint. And if I were going to sell this as a restored unit, I would. I'm not a big fan of repainting whole cases. I'd rather have a very lightly noticeable paint repair there and there and probably if you do a good job you won't even see it 
But even if you don't go, do a good job, that's, uh, to me, that's preferable. It only shows character. You don't have to make it look like it just came out of a box. In fact, that's not what you want, in my opinion. Others feel differently. Um, so that's the only, the rest of the top is actually nice, and it's shiny. My camera doesn't catch it, but it's actually shiny. I'm going to show you the two sides. One moment. There's one side. The perfect. No blemishes, and it shines. Man, this thing's, it spent its life in a kind environment. I look at the case, are the screws missing? If they are, why? Why was somebody inside this? Okay, let me turn it around. The other side, very, very nice. This black mark here is what, what I like to do when assessing a, a bad spot. Take your nail, fingernail and rub it back and forth over that spot. Does your fingernail go inward or does it rise outward? That'll tell you if the spot is on top of the paint or if it's dug into the paint. Okay, um, tiny little blemish spot there. Oftentimes it looks like rust, and it is, but it is so minor that it can be polished out and then with a little uh, clear coat over the thing, that spot, you'll never know it was there. No paint needed. Going on to the back, um, especially on a, on a heath kit that's Oft, oft modified, like an HW7 or HW8. Oftentimes the rear panel will show the modification. You'll have extra jacks, you'll have whatever, a switch here and there, usually jacks. <laughs> I assess the power core. In this case, no modifications. In fact, the serial number sticker is not only still there, it's in good condition. Too bad the Heath Kit logo is damaged. A purist would touch that up with a tiny brush, and you could. Or you could, you, I think you can buy water transfer logos for in that design. I'm sure you can. Um, while I'm zoomed in, I checked the condition of the power cord. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, it's a power cord, but it's also, is it a signal cord? No, it is not. No, it is not. So, anyway, it's in fine condition, nice and flexible. Let me zoom back out. Nice and flexible, no uh, cracks in the insulation. It's real supple, so this it's not like this was made in the 30s, like some of the vintage radios I restored in the past. So I'm going to take the screws out, and then we'll lift the cover off and take a look-see. Before I lift the cover off, I forgot to mention something about the front panel. Um, I made a little um, list of items I wanted to mention, otherwise I'd have forgot a lot. Okay, I assessed the front panel. Here's what I look for. Oh no, come on, zoom in. I look for... The lettering. That's of utmost importance to me. More important than the paint on the rest of the unit or rust. Well, terrible rust on the front panels never good. But the lettering, man. People like to dig into that with their thumbnail while they're rotating the knob back and forth. You know, again, you can get water transfer lettering for any heat kit. But you really want to go through that, and it's, if you look real close, you'll see that it's a transfer, unless you coat the whole front panel with lacquer. And I'm not going to do that unless I had to. Let's uh, zoom in on one of these knobs, and you'll see what I mean. Oh, no, I've uh, tilted things. That's also going to happen in my videos. I have an angular error issue in my brain. After that stroke I had. But look at that. Not a mark on it. 
not a mark on it. Right? Perfect condition. When I saw, I'm going to try to get this so I can show you something on the knob, but well, we'll live with that. When I saw that, I couldn't believe it. I realized instantly this machine lived a kind life. Okay, front panel issues. Um, this doesn't have a meter. This does not have a meter, but it has a, a, a window, if you will. I've never seen those windows really yellow. Um, some of the dials are yellow um, inside of like an HW7 or HW8. Those are notorious for yellowing. But if there's a meter, is the lens yellowed? You'll, we'll talk about that when we look at the DX60A, okay? Um, knobs, are they cracked? Oftentimes they're cracked in a place where you can't see the cracks. I'll show you. Um, although s sometimes with these Heath kits, I don't like to rotate, especially band switches, until I've got the bottom guts exposed. Because if there's a contact problem, you can destroy the switch and render the unit unrepairable. Unless you can find a parts machine. Um, but you that's best practice. Don't rotate it until you have access to the wafers. I never practice best, best practice when I'm... I can't stand it, man. I've got to twiddle the knobs. And in this case, if you watch the dial scale up here, rotating the knob not only changes electrical um, circuits, but it also mechanically moves that like that, right? Is it aligned? Uh, Heath Kit's also notorious for not being aligned. Look at this one, since we're looking at it. That's the 80 meter band. See how the numbering is at the very top of the scale and you kind of got to lean down a little to completely see the numbers. Watch as I go through the bands. 40, same. 20 meters, better. 15 meters, great. And on up, right? As you go up the bands, the, the numbering scale, it slowly drops down. <laughs> I don't think they got their gearing ratios just right. But uh, I looked online, and there that's how it is. That's how it is with this VFO. I turn the uh, frequency control knob. Does it turn smoothly? This does. If it doesn't turn smoothly, stop there. <laughs> and on this unit, I also checked the function knob. And uh, it works fine. Since we're talking about knobs, I'm gonna pull. One, I'm gonna pause you and pull one of these knobs off. I want to show you something behind it. Hang on. Okay. Hey Mark, if you're watching, man, I, I I loosened the grub screw. I loosed it. And if you're watching, Fred, you know what it is now. Lucy. Robbie likes Lucy. See those four webs that hold the outer knob to the inner knob? Well, this loves to crack. Not the web, although I've seen that happen, but this part cracks between the webs. When that happens, and the reason it happens is these switches, you know, some of these band switches will have six, eight wafers on them, and it's, they get hard to turn. Even in the best of times, when they're brand new, they're kind of, you know, Click, 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 they go as you rotate them. Um, let that switch get gunky. The bushings get goop gunky with old lube and such. And uh, the knob gets harder and harder to turn, starts slipping. They crank it down and break it. Plus the plastic gets old. Okay, I'm getting talky. I'm getting chatty, as my old supervisor used to say at one nightmare job. Getting kind of chatty, aren't we? So yeah, shut up and go away. <laughs>
but I digress. Yeah, I gotta calm down. <laughs> um, what I do to fix this, I just bend this back into shape, this round thing, as best you know I can. Close up the gaps. I hit the gap gaps with super glue, and when it's dry, no longer when you can't smell the super glue anymore. Oh well, you don't have to wait. Hell, you wouldn't have to wait at all. What I do is I stuff these four empty areas with any kind of material. I've actually used cotton in the past, but my favorite material is coffee filter material. I stuff it in there, pack it in. You don't have to pack it in super tight or anything. What you're doing is forming a structure for the super glue. And then I, once I do that, I just put a couple drops of super glue on each section. The coffee filter wicks it up, quickly turns rock hard and uh, forms a, le a structure, performs the same function as rebar and concrete. And now then that knob will never break again. Guaranteed. You filled these four things in with an ultra hard solid material. It's not going to break unless the whole knob breaks. So that's the knobs. I don't think there's anything more to say about that. I'm going to pause you and uh oh what else do I look at on the front panel? Anything um general condition. But other than that mainly the lettering. Um, okay, I'm going to pause you and take the screws out of the two sides. Hang on. Okay, got the screws out. We'll pop her top. And look at the, look at the inside is what I do. Let me get out of how much rust. There's almost always some. What do I do? Wire brush it off. Hit it with some oil something oily is fine that's how i treat a chassis of a vintage tube type uh broadcast radio right um i'm not a big fan of lacquering sheet metal i'd rather protect it with something else even though it's not as long lasting i'd rather set this aside and we'll take a I'm going to just turn this around and park it for you to look at while I talk about a few things. And uh, I'll point a few things out. There's not much to point out in this machine. The receiver and transmitter will be a lot more interesting for you. But um, immediately the first thing, the very first thing I see is how much dust is there and or rust but dust is a good thing nicotine smoky smell is vicious to remove you may never um, you can greatly mitigate it but you'll never remove it completely um, so on this machine no rust at all well I think it's aluminum I don't know let me grab a magnet no it's steel okay let me zoom in. Look at the sheet metal. Um, with vintage equipment, it's almost always really, really dusty. And not just dusty, but there always seems to get an oily film on it. Not exactly slippery oily, but you can tell it's sticky. More like a sticky film than an oily film. That's a better description. Okay. Um, <laughs> are there any critters? Or have there been any critters that called this home? You know. Uh, <laughs> usually not. Hopefully. But if there have been. Like in a vintage AM radio. That's fine. You can get it out. Be careful. Disinfect it with something. Wear a mask wear gloves until it's clean uh, but uh, all tubes present well in this case we only have two right but they're present it's about if you got it via shipment and eBay don't be shocked if the box rattles and the tubes have fallen out believe it or not they will 
let that b box take one good high bounce upside down and those tubes are out of there <laughs> and um, won't hurt the rest of the unit if it's packed correctly but the tubes they're out of there that's why oftentimes if you're going to ship or buy an item if the if the seller is capable have them remove the tubes and package them separately if they're willing um, what else do I look at? Uh, well, in this case, I look at solder connections, if there are any up top. And almost always there are, but in this case, no. Um, these uh, white trimmer caps are for calibration. Um, when I'm done with these heath kits, I'll be going through the calibration procedure and the alignment procedures. Um, you should have a stock of type 18, type 47 lamps. You should have a couple types, but I believe these are type 47. I really don't care if they work or not. This one looks new, that one's a little dark, but generally you can tell. In a vintage piece of equipment like this, is a dial string broken, um, which runs up here over that pulley. In this case, they are not broken. <laughs> My green mat sliding all over. Um, I'll tell you one thing I saw. Um, let me see. Anything else on my list? No solder connections. If there were, I'd assess the solder joints. How shiny are they? Um, they should be relatively shiny. Um, if they're dull or gray or crumbly looking, um, you've got to repair that joint. You've got to re-solder it. And the best way to do that is you add a little solder to the old. And once you do that, you can much more easily remove it. Much easier that way than just trying to melt it um, without adding fresh to it. It gets really hard to melt. But I just assess the overall mechanical um, physical condition of this machine and uh, I noticed like we said before the dial rotates fine normally I'm not concerned with that what I will do though is take these knobs off all of them and if there's a bushing behind the knob there are not on these switches but they're probably almost guaranteed to be a quarter inch bushing behind this frequency control knob I lubricate it what do I lubricate it with I think I've said before light oil machine oil um, probably can't read that in the glare but anyway it's uh, made for lubricating sewing machines and embroidery machines exceedingly nice oil um, okay we're getting tilty Sorry. I'm going to pause you and fix things. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. When I looked at this machine, when I first got it, I saw the cracks on each end of the tuning dial. Oh no, I took the knob off. Now I can't rotate it. Instead, I'm going to show you. You can see it better. I'm going to pull this off the tripod. Hang on. Okay, look at each end of the tuning dial scale. It's a plastic drum, is what it is. And, uh, oh, I'm running out of memory space. I'm going to have to make a part two. Each end. Well, this is going to have to run into a part two. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. I guess I'll post this tonight and record part two tomorrow. 73.